You're going to learn some things about CSS Grid. We're going to take a little peek behind the curtain at the magic behind CSS Grid with Amy Kapernick. So I got all set up nice and early, and then my computer went to sleep. And it's not full screen. There, now it's full screen. OK. Uh, as Michael has just said, today I'm here to talk to you about CSS Grid. So for those who were not wooing before, if you haven't heard of it, it's a spec that came to browsers a few years ago and revolutionized the way we do layouts on the web. But to start off today, I want to tell you a little story. In the beginning, there was darkness and emptiness. And then Tim Berners-Lee said, let there be internet. Now, the internet was much simpler in those days. It was just HTML content on a page, similar to how we would see it in a Word document. But pretty soon, everybody got sick of looking at Times New Roman. And so Tim said, let the fonts and colors and sizes and positions be changeable. And then there was CSS. Now, we've come a long way with both CSS and with our layouts since then. We went the, through the table layouts that still continue to haunt our nightmares. And if you're building email templates, probably still your day jobs. Then to Flexbox. No, sorry. Then on to Floats, where we had to clear fix everything. Then rejoicing at Flexbox and the fact that we could finally vertically center content again. <laughs> so. When CSS Grid launched two years ago, we were really excited. We could finally control our layout in both directions. We could dictate how the elements inside of a grid behaved. We could reduce the code we were writing. And even better, we could reduce the thinking needed to make our layout responsive. Now, I do want to add a disclaimer, because everybody says this to me, well, isn't this you know, just table layout? I've already got that. Uh, no, CSS Grid is specifically designed for creating layouts, whereas tables is something we used as a hack. Now, I don't hate tables. Tables still do have a place. I actually have tables on my website. They're really useful for things like, you know, tables of data, that kind of thing. Now, CSS Grid also helps us to get back to writing semantic HTML which we just learned from Jess has accessibility benefits. So that's got to be good. We can now write our HTML based on the logical flow of a document and let CSS rearrange it visually when we need to. When this is done right, this means that our content can be more accessible to anybody using reader mode, saving an article for later, or using a screen reader or assistive technology. Now, CSS Grid also makes it easier to mock up and build out layouts of applications. And Michael said this morning that there was no time for us to get in depth in our talks today. I'm going to prove him wrong. Today, we're going to build a note-taking app. I've got our HTML structure. So we know what we want the layout to look like. We've got our wireframe. Now, I'd also like to note that this is pure semantic HTML. No container divs just semantic HTML. So let's see how we go. This is what our content looks like. OK, I'll be, there's some other CSS at play here, I'll be honest. And we're going to start off nice and easy and apply display grid to our body. And that kind of does nothing. Next, we're going to let the browser know what we, want our want, what we want our grid to look like. So I've split our wireframe up into five totally very equal columns and three rows. And so we're going to define our columns first using a CSS property called grid template columns. So we can go 200 pixels, 200 pixels, 200 pixels, 200 pixels, 200 pixels which is OK now. But what happens if we had a 20 column grid? Like, that's a bit ridiculous, right? So instead, I'm going to say repeat five 200 pixels. Now, the repeat function is something we get with grid, and it allows us to define the number of times to repeat something and the size of the column that we're repeating. 
So for example, repeat three 200 pixels would give us 200 pixels, 200 pixels, 200 pixels. We can use any units we want in here. If it's a CSUS unit, it goes. We can also define patterns. For example, repeat two 10 pixels, 20 viewport widths would give us 10 pixels, 20 viewport widths, 10 pixels, 20 viewport widths. You try saying that five times quickly. Or we can use percentages. So because I have five equal width columns, I could say repeat five 20%, which would take up 20, each of the columns would take up 20% of my app, which I'm pretty sure adds up to 100, but I can't guarantee doing math right now. But then if I change it, what if I want six columns? Then I've got to try and work out how many percent wide each of them needs to be. So instead, I'm going to say repeat five, one FR. Now, the FR unit is something that has come to with grid and is often used in the place of percentages because it takes away a lot of the issues that we have. It works similar to the Flexbox basis property. And so to try and explain how the FI unit works, if we have a grid with columns of 100 pixels, 1 FR, 50 pixels, 2 FR, and we want to have a gap of 20 pixels between each of those columns, I'm going to touch on the grid gap property later. What the FR unit does is it takes 100% of our element width, say 510 pixels. It then takes away any existing defined content. So we have one column of 100 pixels and one column of 50 pixels, which is 150 pixels. Then takes away any gap. Now, <coughs> grid is pretty smart. It knows that even though we've got four columns, that means we only have three gaps which means 20 pixels times three is 60 pixels. Then divides it by the number of FR units that we have, which we've got one FR, two FR, so divides it by three. Anyone able to do math at this point in the afternoon? <laughs> For this particular layout at this screen size, we're looking at one FR of 100 pixels, which means our grid becomes 100 pixels, 100 pixels, 50 pixels, 200 pixels. As our screen size changes, those FR columns would continue to grow and shrink as needed in relation to whatever FR we've assigned them, so one and two. So if I define five columns of one FR wide, what that's going to do is it's going to make them all equal width, which is nice and easy. And if I change that five to a six, it's going to make six columns all equal width. This is really useful because it takes away all of that percentage math that we used to have to do. So if we look at what that does, there, we've got five, sorry, we've got five equal width columns in our grid layout now. Next, we want to define how many rows we have. And if we have a look again at our wireframe, I've defined a fixed height header, a fixed height footer, and I want the remainder of the, I want the middle to take up all of the remainder space. So we're going to define grid template rows, 100 pixel for the header, 50 pixel for the footer, and one FR for the middle. So that'll take up whatever space is left in our application. And that looks like this. Now you might think this looks like it did before, but before where we just had columns, they took up the full height whereas now the items have been confined to our 100 pixel high header region and obviously are overflowing. And you can't really see the other rows because they don't have content yet. But we're going to get to that now, actually. So now we want to assign each of our elements where they should be sitting inside the grid. And this is where it's really, but we're going to start off with the header. And there's several ways to do this. And this is what's really useful because grid numbers each of the lines in the grid. So we can define which lines we want the header to go from and to. So if we have a look at our grid, it, it, each of the lines are numbered from 1 to 6. So we want our header to start at 1. So we say grid column start 1. We want it to go all the way to the end. So we could say grid column six, 
But what happens if we change the size of our grid? I've then got to redefine this. This is where it's really useful because grid doesn't just number them from one to six. It also numbers them negatively back the other way. So I can actually say I want it to go to line negative one. No matter what size our grid is, that's always going to be the very end. So I can say grid column end minus one. Or I can use the shorthand, which is grid column one slash minus one. And this has now pushed our header to take up the full width of our top row and it's pushed the rest of the elements down onto the second row. Next, we want to get our nav to take up the second and third row. And similar to columns, all of our grids have the same numbered lines, one, two, three, four, minus one, minus two, minus three, minus four. So we can define the nav to have grid row two slash minus one. So start at line two and go down to minus one. Or we can use an alternative way of defining grid column, which is just to define, the, sorry, defining grid row, which is define the, the span. So we can just say we want it to span two rows, which is the middle and bottom row. And if we have a look, that now pushes that down. If you're able to see at the bottom of the slide, that's now pushed the nav down to go all the way to the bottom of our application. We then want to get the main element to take up the rest of the middle row. And so we say main grid column span four. So span four columns. That pushes it all the way out and has now pushed our footer down onto the bottom row. And to finish up, we're gonna get our footer to take up the remainder of that bottom row. So footer is grid column span four. There we go. One of the other really useful things that Grid does is it gives us access to named areas of our grid. We can define these using grid template areas. These are really useful for when you're rearranging the way an application works in various screen sizes. So when we define this, we have one row for each row in our grid. So we've got three lines and one word for each of our columns. So you can see here, we've set our header to take up the full top row. Our nav takes up the first column of the second and third row. Our note takes up the remainder of the middle row and our footer takes up the remainder of the bottom. We then assign these areas we've defined here to each of our grid children with grid area header, grid area nav, grid area note and grid area footer because you know naming things is hard. This is where when you're getting started with Grid or even when you're using it every day, I recommend using Firefox as your browser because they have a really great Grid inspector. It's really useful for working out the way the different Grid is working and particularly for when you're using named areas, it allows you to overlay these so you can see what's going on in your Grid. So I recommend having a look at that one when you're using it. So basic layout of our application, it's done. And that's in seven lines of CSS. And I'm only partially through my talk, so that's not bad. But if we have a look at our wireframe, our note didn't just take up the main section there, it actually had a sidebar as part of the article as well, which isn't what we currently have. So, to do that, we can redefine a grid inside of our grid. And to do that, I'm going to set display grid on our main element as well, which just kind of pushes it so it takes up the full area there. Now, I want this child grid to take up the same columns as the parent grid. So I can just redefine them as it changes. So I can say grid template columns repeat four one FR which will give me four equal width columns, the same as what the main element is currently taking up. But then if the main changes how many columns it spans, that's going to change. And this is where we can use another really useful feature, which is called CSS subgrid. And I can define grid template columns subgrid. What this does is it defines the columns to match the parent grid. So if you're able to see the green outline there, that's a child grid, but 
the two items inside of it are still taking up columns the same way they should with inside the parent grid. So this is really cool. Then I assign to the article, I want it to span three of those columns, which pushes it out so our sidebar sits on the end of that main area there. Now, Subgrid is still relatively new and there's really great documentation on MDM, so I recommend having a look at that one. Now, if I take away some of my beautiful colours in the application, it's bad, right? It's pretty good. But it's okay while I only have a few notes. I want an overall view as well to show all of the notes I have, you know, kind of like in a grid. I wonder what I can do with that. So if I have a look at my overview here, here's all of my notes, and we're going to again define a new grid for this view. And so I'm going to define grid template columns, repeat 10, 300 pixels. And look, that's fine, but what happens if I'm looking on my phone? I don't have 3,000 pixels worth of screen on my phone. Maybe when I get one of the new Microsoft folding ones, it'll work. So instead, I'm going to say repeat autofill 300 pixels. Now, autofill is another new property. Uh, it has a pair auto fit. And there's a really great visual representation of what these two do here, uh, which is autofill, which is the top one, fills the row with as many columns as it can fit, even if we don't have enough elements to need that many. Whereas autofit fits the currently available elements into columns and it expands to take up extra space. Or you can just do what I do, which is flip between the two of them until it does what I want it to do. I think it's like a USB. You've got to try three goes until you get the right one. <laughs> so if I say repeat autofill 300 pixels, does anyone remember what that one is? Gives me as many columns as it can fit, even if I don't need them. However, what happens if I've then got 250 pixels left over? My grid isn't going to line up with the edge properly, which is a bit annoying. So I can, instead of defining 300 pixels, I can say min max 300 pixels and one FR. Now, min max allows you to define a minimum and a maximum. And it will work between the two of them and expand and contract as needed. So I can set a minimum of 100 pixels, max of 20 viewport widths. I can set a minimum of 100 pixels and a maximum of one FR. I can set a minimum of 1FR with a maximum of 300 pixels. Again, we can use all of our CSS units here. So if I set min max 300 pixels, 1FR, and that's for the repeat autofill, it will give me this. Looking pretty good. Then I want to define the rows, and again, I'm going to use repeat autofill because I don't want to try and set how many rows I'm going to need, and I'm going to set these to be 150 pixels high because I just want little blocks, which is not bad. But things are looking a little bit cramped, so this is when we're going to go through and have a look at the gaps that we touched on before. So I'm going to set grid column gap 20 pixels, which will put 20 pixels between each of my columns, and grid row gap of 20 pixels, which will put 20 pixels between each of my rows, or I can use the shorthand, which is just grid gap of 20 pixels. Now, a lot of people ask the question of what, why can't I just use a margin? Like, I could already do that with Flexbox. Because of this. You know the issue with Flexbox where you had to do negative margins on a parent element, or you had to do these lovely nth child recipes to go, well, for every fifth one, you should remove the margin on the right, and for the first five, you should remove the margin on the top, and for the last five, you should remove the margin on the bottom. Or <coughs> grid gap just knows to put the gap between each of the grid items like this. Again, this is where it's really useful to use the Firefox dev tools because it allows you to visualize where that gap is and what's going on with your content. So, this sounds pretty awesome, right? Surely I'm not hiding anything from you. <laughs> so, it's actually better than you would think. Uh, CSS Grid launched uh, wi without any browser prefixes, so the support's actually pretty awesome. 
It's been in Chrome since version 57. It's been in Firefox since 52. Safari since 10.1. Edge since 16. And that's all the... <laughs> so, CSS Grid has been supported in Internet Explorer since version 10. Sort of. <laughs> so, it may surprise you to know that IE was actually the first browser to start implementing CSS Grid. When we first started talking about it, IE went ahead and started implementing it. However, that was like version one of the spec, and it's kind of changed since then uh, in the way that basically none of it is the same. <laughs> and because IE isn't being updated, it hasn't been updated. Uh, so IE thinks it can do it, uh, but you probably, it's not working the way you expect. If you do want to have a look into it, that you can find the original version of the spec. If you're having trouble sleeping or you're bored, you can see whether that will work for you. So what do these numbers mean? Well, globally, we're looking at about 90.65% support for CSS Grid. So depending on your particular use cases, that's pretty good. Uh, so the really cool subgrid thing that I showed you before that everyone wants to go back and try, that was really awesome. So yeah, um, confession. Yeah. <laughs> CSS subgrid is currently only available in Firefox nightly. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. However, do have some good news. Uh, so right before I gave this talk a couple of weeks ago, I found a tweet and had to do a last minute talk change, which I definitely wasn't doing already, uh, because Firefox uh, from version 71 is getting CSS subgrid capabilities. Uh, so that is due to launch in uh, early December, uh, if you're wanting to have a look at that. Uh, Flexbox is often used as a fallback for CSS Grid and it's been around longer so has much better support. You're looking at about 98% support for Flexbox. Really, unless you're having to support anything beyond IE10, you're probably fine with Flexbox. If you are having to support anything beyond IE10, I'm, I'm just really sorry. <laughs> One of the great things about CSS as well is we have access to a supports query. And what this means is that we're not actually delivering unsupported code to our browsers. So supports query, if you're not familiar with it, works similar to a media query, allows us to define a CSS property and a value, then put code inside of it. If a browser doesn't know what to do with that property and value, it will ignore the code inside of it. Now, funnily enough, support isn't supported in all browsers. <laughs> But the great news is if a browser doesn't support the supports query, there's no way in hell it's going to support grid. <laughs> and it's just going to ignore your whole block of code anyway. So you can, for example, go supports display grid, put your grid code inside of there, and if it doesn't know what to do with display grid, it's just going to ignore it. And you're not delivering those unsupport that unsupported code to your users, uh, which is fine, except for this guy. Uh, so, as I said, IE has a implementation of Display Grid. So, if you do a supports query for Display Grid, IE goes, I got this, it's right, step back, I can do this one. Uh, but it, it probably has no clue what you're doing with the rest of the properties inside of it. This is an easy fix, though. Rather than checking for Display Grid, check for a property that IE doesn't know what to do with. For example, I usually test for grid template areas and then put my grid code inside of that. And I know IE is going to ignore it like I want it to. So this sounds awesome, right? And I know what you're all going to do. You're going to go back to work on Monday and go, so I learned about this awesome thing and we need to start using it straight away. And I know exactly what your boss is going to say. But... So I'm going to give you some answers for those buts so you can go back. But there's not enough support. 90.65% globally is pretty good. Again, this depends on your use cases. If you work for a bank or any kind of financial institution, I'm sorry, yes, you're probably not going to be able to use Grid. However, the great thing is we also have the supports query, which means we're not delivering unsupported code to our browsers. But then we have to write a fallback. Good news. 
you've already got one. If your code currently works in these browsers, that's your fallback. Write grid code inside of a supports query and it will use that if it can. So you don't have to worry about writing a new fallback. But we don't have time. You want to know a secret? You don't actually have to put grid everywhere. Pick one component, one section, one page. Start implementing grid there and go from there. You don't have to start using it everywhere. But then we'll have to maintain it. You want to know another secret? It's just CSS. No frameworks, no packages to update. It's just CSS. This isn't JavaScript. We're not having to try and update it every 10 minutes. So, summing up what we've discussed here today, that was, that was basically it, right? CSS Grid is awesome and I do want you all to go back to work on Monday and tell your bosses about it and start using it or at the very least convince them that you need to be spending some of your time learning it properly. And to learn it, there are a bunch of amazing resources out there. If you're not familiar with CSS Tricks, they have a really great guide to Grid. I look at this every single day, multiple times a day. It's an excellent resource once you get started. There's a really great online course by Where's Boss. This is free and really useful for trying out. Even if you're, you don't really like doing video tutorials, I recommend looking at this anyway. I hate video tutorials and this one was awesome. If you still don't like doing video tutorials, you can uh, get the new CSS layout by Rachel Andrew. You can get it in ebook or paperback format. Really, anything by Rachel Andrew is probably a good place to go. She's lot of, got a lot of really amazing talks, blog posts, and demos on CSS Grid and on Subgrid. You can also look at pretty much anything by Jen Simmons, who does a lot of really amazing stuff with CSS Grid. If you're wanting to have some fun while you're doing it, you can also check out CSS Grid Garden, which is a gamified way <laughs> of learning Grid. So then when your boss comes round, you can go, no, no, I'm not playing a game, I'm learning. This is personal development time. If you're familiar with it um, and you want to recap on Flexbox, there's also Flexbox Froggy you can check out. And the great news is I've been giving this talk all year and I finally got my sample code in a condition that I was comfortable with sharing with the audience. So you can check out the code that I've gone through today on GitHub. There is also a separate branch called Talk which goes through each of the steps that I go through in my talk. Great news is if you missed any of these resources, they are being tweeted out like magic as I speak. Uh, so you can find them all online as well as my slide deck. Thank you very much for having me at LaraCon today. It's been a pleasure.